Aboriginal people make up 30% of the population, but we make up 85% of the adult population and almost 100% of young people in the detention centres. It's a shameful figure and we need to address it. I think it's best for the people who have the problem to, to deal with the problem. Give the community the wherewithal to deal with their problems because they're best suited to solve those problems, not me or you or someone who lives in Canberra. You know, they're best dealt with locally. It would be a foolish decision not to fund this agreement. We can't build bigger prisons. We can't keep locking up Aboriginal people. I'm Leanne Little. I'm the director of the Aboriginal Justice Unit that sits within the Department of Attorney General's and Justice Northern Territory Government uh, system. And my role is to deliver a justice agreement where we partner with Aboriginal people to address three main issues. One, we need to reduce Aboriginal imprisonment and the re-offending rates. The second one is we need to support and promote Aboriginal leadership because without leadership, we won't be able to control or improve the safety of those communities. And the third one is to make sure that we have services uh, that are accessible and available to Aboriginal people for them to use so that when uh, they are uh, touching the justice system, they can bounce back off rather than be ingrained and embedded and have a long time relationship with the justice system. The Northern Territory covers a vast region of Australia, stretching from the desert to the tropics. With a landmass greater than South Africa, it's home to more than a hundred different Aboriginal language groups. Leanne Little, a government lawyer, has spent three years travelling to more than 80 of the Northern Territory's remote Indigenous communities. It's part of a plan to bridge the divide between Aboriginal people and the Northern Territory's justice system. Today, she's travelled to the community of Arionga in Central Australia, more than 1,700 kilometres from the Halls of Power in Darwin. <laughs> Driving through the streets to spread the message, she's here to talk, and more importantly, to listen to people's stories. Because this isn't just about a story. This is government really want to do this and they need to do this with Aboriginal people. A key fix for people here is resetting their relationship with police. A community-based night patrol keeps the peace here, but officers from a neighbouring community about an hour's drive from here come when there's trouble. Leanne hears earlier this year police came at night to arrest a local. But people here thought they were too rough and said that they threatened an elder with pepper spray when he stepped in. If they come into Arianga to arrest people with warrant, they got to come out to office first and get night patrol. Night patrol, number one, and they can go and get Yaba. That story we hear a lot, it doesn't matter if we're in the top end or down south. There's no local court or police base in this community. The Western justice system is barely visible. People ring Triple O and the police come here and they're here to make the community safer because some, there's fighting and there's arguments. We know Gunja comes in. 
So the police will, ca will come when people ring them up because they want, they're there, they're doing their job. They're doing their job to make the community safer. If it's a safety meeting, you should take your belt, put the gun away for later. On the basketball courts, the community lays bare fault lines between black and white Australia, deepened by barriers of language and distance. We gotta be strong, not listening to the white people all the time. We got a law in their head. You gotta come and meet us halfway. Jungle, together, you gotta be there to make the community safer, to stop the kids going to jail and, and parents going to jail. Leanne is confident by travelling to Aboriginal communities and listening to the people, giving them a voice, that the divide can be fixed. Part of the proposal so far is using local solutions involving elders in community courts and justice groups advising the government. People were very clear they wanted community courts back uh, to empower the leadership in the community and restore, restore some of the um, core principles around what creates a safer community and law and justice groups. I mean, Everybody wanted a law and justice group and that tells me that the system isn't working as well as what it should if that is now the platform that people want. Fixing this justice system is a role that Leanne Little is uniquely qualified for. The Aranda woman, originally from Alice Springs, has spent her career working to improve the outcomes from the inside. Leanne was still in her teens when she crossed the border to join the police force in Adelaide, becoming the first Aboriginal policewoman in South Australia. I was really brought up on the principles of fairness. Like, that's what drove me to the police force. But after almost a decade on the job, she took the South Australian police force to the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission for Racism. She broke down in the witness box as she detailed her decision, saying it was her life and she didn't want to resign. From the age of 10, Leanne Little had a dream. In 1988, that dream was realised. Leanne was accepted into Fort Largs Police Academy and began her training. Crown solicitor Alan Moss told the hearing all 48 witnesses would deny or offer a reasonable explanation of Miss Little's allegations. Ms Little claimed she was subjected to racist treatment from the time her training began at Fort Largs. Ms Little alleged today she was told she was lower than a police dog, at least a police dog has been trained. A spokesman for the Crown solicitor says the parties are still resolving the terms and conditions of the settlement and due to the sensitivity of the negotiations, they'll remain... The case was settled for an undisclosed sum and Leanne walked away from the police force and her childhood dreams. I don't really like talking about it because it just brings back really bad memories. You know, I might look like a really um, sound, uh, you know, robust, stoic person, but in those days they were really dark. You know, I used to hide in a cupboard and not open the door. Halfway between Adelaide and Darwin, in the centre of Australia, is the town of Alice Springs. It's here that Leanne returned to rebuild her life after leaving the force, and a gathering with family offers an insight into how she achieved that. I think I was really privileged in that we've got a really strong family, and not just, you know, immediate family, I've got a really big, extended family. And if I was going to fall over, they were going to pick me up. 
Back in town after a week of travel to remote central Australian communities, Leanne's family have pulled together a barbecue at the old telegraph station to catch up. This reserve holds special significance for Leanne. Her family are descendants of the stolen generations, with some of their relatives held on the grounds just beyond this picnic site at a centre known as the bungalow. Both my grandmothers uh, were in the bungalows. In fact, we only have one picture on my mother's side of my great-grandmother, and that's looking through a cyclone wire fence to her children. A generation later, Leanne's mother and uncle were also removed under stolen generations and taken further afield to Victoria. That history's raw for us, you know? It's had an impact. Um, and people remember that story that's um, it's it's trauma and even those stories haven't been resolved in this space with Aboriginal people. It was Leanne's aunts who took her to lay the initial complaint of racism against the South Australian police, an event that remains topical with Leanne's police graduation photograph used in recent PR material. This year, the uh, South Australian police had Leanne as their pin-up girl. <laughs> we all had a big laugh. <laughs> so if, you go, if you Google... Leanne's family is keenly aware of what standing up for her rights cost her and are intensely proud that she followed through with it. I felt really sad about um, Leanne having to deal with that, that and go through Ooh. that. So... But she's come out at the other end. Well, she's come out as their pin-up girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of who we are as a family that we've kind of, we're just going to keep the fight up. Fighting the South Australian police was punishing and came at a personal cost, but it's given Leanne a detailed understanding of the systems in place to help Aboriginal people. You've got to know how to navigate the system and you've got to have the courage and the strength of people around you to support you to move through it and come out OK the other end. <laughs> After leaving the force, Leanne retrained as a lawyer, building her own small Aboriginal justice unit within government. The police force gave me some really good skills. They gave me good listening skills, uh, good conciliation skills. It gave me um, the foundations really that I now understand the system so well that I can bring that to the table as well as being a lawyer. Flying over salt plains 290 kilometres northwest of Alice Springs, the community of Yundamu emerges on the edge of the Tanami Desert. It's the second time in two years Leanne's been here to talk about problems with the justice system. But things have changed since her last visit. Good evening, Amy Colbert with ABC News. The remote central Australian community of Yuendamu is reeling after a 19-year-old man was shot and killed by police last night. In court, defence lawyer David Edwardson QC said his client will vigorously defend the murder charge. He said the officer was acting in good faith when he fired his gun last month in Yuendamu. Yundamu was thrust into the national spotlight after 19-year-old Aboriginal man Kumanjai Walker was shot dead by police here in an attempted arrest. The shooting sparked Black Lives Matter rallies across the country with calls of justice for Walker. We want justice for Walker! Elders and police worked to bring back relations from the brink of collapse. A man has died and now a Northern Territory police officer has been charged with one count of murder. I have police officers who are hurting. I have a community that is hurting. My interest is to help you all. The police force grappled with discontent within its ranks after a murder charge was laid against Constable Zachary Rolfe, who is due to face a trial. 
given Constable Rolf's case is before the courts, it limits what Leanne can I'm say to this that community. People, no, don't worry, we, we can, we can just point out. We'll just sit down here and just quickly just have a quick talk. There's no country. connection back to the country. Country or culture. Lower, lower. And you're missing that when you're in prison. You're missing that. And you're, ceremonies. You're, I say more running it down. Right. Running it down. It's not good. Walpuri elder Ned Hargraves is cultural broker for this meeting and tells Leanne this community needs an injection of jobs and rehabilitation programs to help young people stuck in a cycle of crime. The grub, the kanja, everything that's making us disrespect our culture. We think they will go to prison to be rehabilitated. But the reality is we know there's not enough programs there in prison for us to change our ways. You and I know. Thank you, everyone. My name is Leanne Little, and I'm a lawyer with the Department of Attorney General and Justice. And I've been given the job to write up the justice agreement for the Northern Territory. Among the elders gathered are Eddie Robertson and his wife Lottie. They took in Kormanjai Walker as a child and are still mourning his death. They won't talk about the shooting last year, but have come to talk about the laws and policies that disproportionately affect Aboriginal people. We don't want to go through this racial discrimination with non-Indigenous people. They need to understand we bleed the same. When I want to see the government to see the, the laws that are there that are very hurting us, and there are laws from there that they can change it through constitution. And um, we believe if we put some, some of our wording to that law, maybe we believe it can help us to stop and look at it and then change it. He tells the gathering that if the laws aren't changed, this community will stop voting in Northern Territory elections. It's a significant warning from the Walpuri elder who was acknowledged as Senior Northern Territorian of the Year in 2015 for his work liaising between Yuendamu and government agencies. There are certainly issues around the Sentencing Act, the Bail Act and the Parole Act that people have identified of areas for change and they're impacting significantly on Aboriginal people. Walpuri elder Ned Hargraves ends the discussion with his own parting message for government. We want to say no guns right across the central Australia, whether it's Queensland, whether it's WA, whether it's Alanda, Walpuri, whatever. We want no rifles. Police weapons fall outside Leanne's remit. But she says there are historical reasons why communities find exposed weapons threatening. I mean, we heard it several times. They said that they um, did not want exposed firearms. Uh, they, you know, they said, and they included rifles in that, they said that was a sign of aggression. Just 60 kilometres from Yuendamu is the memorial for the nation's last government-sanctioned massacre of Aboriginal people. The Coniston Massacre was led by a mounted police officer in 1928, with more than 60 men, women and children shot down in retribution for the killing of a white man. You can't ignore the history that Aboriginal people have had with the justice system. I mean, it started with uh, when there were administrators on the land and you know, people took away children that had uh, non-Aboriginal blood in them. And those people are elderly people and grandparents in the community. The Coniston massacres and what happened there, um, it's all raw, particularly to the old people. Hast's Bluff, 230 kilometres west of Alice Springs, is one of the last communities Leanne will visit before finalising her Aboriginal Justice Agreement. She's held more than 150 consultations in dozens of languages, and what she's heard is that many remote communities are on the brink of collapse. She says the graveyards and health clinics are full. And only five of the 80 communities she's visited are fully functioning. It comes after a decade of record spending in Indigenous affairs, 
with the federal government's intervention into remote Indigenous communities in the Territory and the Closing the Gap initiatives. Programs that Leanne says should have been better grounded in the needs of communities. They feel disempowered. They feel their leadership isn't uh, important anymore. No matter how hard they try, at the end of the day, people go and they come in and consult and they listen to the community, but they don't hear what they're saying. You can't hear from Aboriginal people unless you use interpreters, unless you use cultural brokers. Elders in Hast's Bluff tell Leanne the Western justice system has stripped them of their traditional Aboriginal law, and they have grave concerns about the Western justice system that's replaced it, particularly with youth detention. When people used to do the wrong thing, they used to get punished. Not go to jail, punishment. That's been given from our law, our culture. That's been taken away from the government. And we need those justice to come back so we can work equally, equally with the government. Their justice and our justice, working as one. Leanne says there are concerns about customary law, which is often associated with violence and payback. The draft justice agreement doesn't mention incorporating customary law into the mainstream legal system. But Douglas Malta says it can work with the Western justice system. If you know in the police, they want to pick someone in the community that has trouble, they need to come and see the elders in the community first. They're doing their job while we need to do our job as well to keep the community safe. But people said they wanted uh, to improve the cultural responsibility and the cultural authority by putting in place those law and justice groups. And without those law and justice groups, they can't assert their leadership. They're never going to be able to control the safety of their community if they're not empowered and supported to drive that change. Behind the Territory's nation-leading incarceration rates are extraordinary rates of crime, fueling deep philosophical divides between the left and right of politics on how it should be addressed. Finding bipartisanship on this work is important. Leanne Little has a commitment from all sides of politics to implement an Aboriginal justice agreement. Although during the recent election campaign, neither major party, including the governing Labor government, which initiated the agreement, set out a budget for implementing the plan. I wouldn't put my hand up and say I would do this if I didn't think at the end of the line that this was going to happen. Leanne has already had some wins, opening a rehabilitation facility in Alice Springs as a sentencing alternative for female offenders. And she says leaders on Groot Island off the Top End coast have committed royalty money to construct a similar facility for their young people. But the Labor government has stalled on important law reforms like a promise to abolish paperless arrest laws that give police the power to lock Territorians up over minor infringements instead of fining them. Paperless arrest laws won't be addressed under the Aboriginal Justice Agreement, but as a former police officer and a lawyer, Leanne understands they are problematic, fueling the perception that the justice system is harsher on Aboriginal people. Police discretion was one of the areas that got brought up time and time again about the inequality in the system and the lack of accountability at the end of the day, how is it that you can have an Royal Commission that's been agreed to by the government and the nation that says we're to use arrest as a last resort when there's so many people being arrested for the same or similar offences that non-Aboriginal people are being cautioned or reported on? I, I think we need to have accountability in that space and I think we need to do things different. Aboriginal justice agreements were developed in response to recommendations from the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, handed down in 1991. The Territory's Treaty Commissioner, Professor Mick Dodson, was council assisting on that commission. Well, I, I think looking at what's happening in the Northern Territory, um, it would do what the commission recommended, uh, particularly getting a territory-wide focus with localised power of decision-making 
and involvement in policy, law and practice. Um, that's really important. 30 years on, Professor Dodson says the need for Aboriginal justice agreements in all jurisdictions of Australia remains critical. Why have we got, you know, approaching 450 deaths um, since um, the report was released 29 years ago? You know, one of the one of the findings, foundation findings, if you like, of the commission was the fact of overrepresentation. Got too many people in there. You're going to have over disproportional deaths in custody. Aboriginal people account for more than 70% of the deaths in custody recorded in the Northern Territory between 1990 and 2018. If the Aboriginal people in the Territory are willing to partner, which they've shown with their commitment and, the, and through the consultations, their um, stories to us, then we've got a moral obligation to fix this. It costs thousands of dollars to keep someone into prison. In comparison to what people have asked for to drive that change, it won't require a lot of money, but it will require a lot of change in the way government does business. The Darwin prison is a world away from the communities Leanne has spent months in, but finding solutions for the agreement means going behind the wire to hear from prisoners on the triggers for their behaviour. The $1.8 billion Darwin prison opened six years ago and is already full. Prisoner Shanston Charlie has been in jail for 16 months and is hoping to get paroled next year. He tells Leanne he ran into trouble with the law after he bit his brother's ear off during a drunken brawl. I spoke to him after that, you know, I couldn't stop thinking about it, you know. I had to apologise, you know. I hope you forgive me, you know. It makes you shame, you know, what you do, you know, and it makes you guilty, you know. Yeah. Shanston Charlie tells Leanne he's struggling being apart from his culture and family. He says it would be great to have corrections programs and alcohol rehabilitation available back in community. Um, alcohol is, is like um, when you feel stressed, you want to go drink, you know. Yeah. And then, but it does get you in trouble in the end. Yeah. That's why a lot of us here in prison. You know? Leanne Little explains Shanston will need support to beat the odds outside of prison. Government figures show that of every 10 Aboriginal men released from prison in the Territory, six return to jail within two years. It costs Territory taxpayers more than $300 a day to incarcerate an adult prisoner. That figure jumps to more than $3,000 a day for every child in youth detention. Community corrections programs are delivered at a fraction of that cost. That's probably been the hardest thing to try and get people to understand. It's about saving taxpayers money. It's about making sure that your hard-earned tax dollar gets spent where it needs to be spent. So it doesn't become uh, harder for you years down the track where you're paying double the amount of tax to you know, support the prisons and to support the child protection scheme. The fastest growing cohort in the Darwin jail is female prisoners. 57-year-old Kay Woodroff bears significant scars from a life of extreme violence. She tells Leanne she was 15 when she was badly beaten under customary law for trying to leave a promised marriage. At 16, she had her first baby, and by 23, she started to drink. What followed was a string of offences, ending with the violent stabbing of her sister on the banks of the Catherine River in May 2015. That's why I'm in, in here, about her. Are you okay to tell the story? Yeah, they said that I killed my sister here yeah, and I, we were both drunk. We were too, you know. Do you remember? No, sometimes I can't remember. Leanne tells Kay that she's not alone. She says government figures show more than half of Aboriginal prisoners are in jail for violent offences, and many of those cases involved alcohol. My goal is to stop drinking, and that, that is true. And I, you won't see me come back in prison. If I would have them 
forces back then, this wouldn't happen. The vast majority of domestic violence victims in the Northern Territory are Aboriginal. Leanne says that violence is feeding into a cycle of trauma and crime that must be addressed to stop people ending up in jail. That is the very reason why programs need to be uh, built into the community, delivered in the community and culturally competent so that the community feels safe to attend that. There are medical reasons uh, why people uh, do crime. The critics out there may say, oh, that's just, you know, that, that's just a get out of free jail card. But a lot of the offenders have significant uh, mental health issues. They have uh, FASD. They have um, uh, medical conditions that need treatment. Leanne Little is personally invested in reducing the violence. Her eldest sister was killed in a violent domestic attack in the Territory. We went through the justice system and it was really fair. It was, um, we felt like, um, we felt like we'd been treated fairly through the process. Um, it was terrible because, um, you know, my, my, my sister had an Aboriginal partner and it meant that it, impacted on lots of people, not just us. With consultations done, Leanne Little is back in Darwin on homework duties with her son Jack and daughter Tilly. Jack has been doing a high school assignment on Heroes and Leanne is using it as an opportunity to teach him about his family and his people's history. So who's that? Harold Little. Dad. Yeah. And what did he do? He went to the army. He's in the army? Yeah. He and he went to war? He went to yeah. Borneo? She can't help but feel disappointed that so many of the issues her parents and grandparents faced will remain for her children. I think you could turn this around in less than five years. But you've got to you know, not be in denial and say that there's no racism in your agency or no racism in the Northern Territory, because there is, and we heard it at almost, if not every single consult. You feel like you're not wanted in your own country. You make to, to be feel not proud that you're Aboriginal. And that, look at all these photos, like, I could be more prouder of all my family and what they've achieved. Leanne is determined her justice agreement will affect change and is optimistic that the time is right to fix the system for the next generation. But if you are a world leader, come and listen best. Listen to what they're going to tell us. After three years and thousands of kilometres in travel to consult with communities, Leanne is now ready to finalise her report and hand it to government. I want Australians to understand if we don't tackle the issue of racism, then we will never get ahead as Aboriginal people. Ask yourself why it is. Why it is that we fill in the prisons? Why it is we fill in the hospitals? Why it is that we've got low literacy rates? Why it is that we've failed on the previous closing the gap targets? And you might start to get some of the answers that you need to those questions.